everyone. I want to give a special shout out to those of you that are joining us online and especially uh, to our Mill Creek campus uh, who are joining us for this sermon. We continue in our series called By Faith. You know, a number of years ago, uh, I was standing in the checkout line at uh, Target and I had an old $20 bill. Remember those? They don't look anything like the $20 bills, even if you use cash, which most of us don't these days. But I had this old $20 bill and I was trying to pay for uh, my purchases. And the cashier, a young girl, looked at it, looked at me, looked at it, looked at me suspiciously, went and got the manager. They came back, looked at the bill, looked at me, and I thought, what is going on? Took out a light and shined it on the bill and finally declared that it was, uh, it was good. And I asked what, what had happened. They said, well, we hadn't seen one of those in a long time, and they, they used to have to check the current bills to see if they're legit, if they're not uh, forges, if they're not, uh, you know, uh, fake currency. And they didn't know how to do that with the old $20 bill. I thought that was funny. And then I began to think about that. I even went on, did some online research. How do you tell if something, if a dollar bill, a $20 bill is genuine or authentic? There's lots of tests, by the way, things I didn't know. There's the colored threads. I knew about those that are in the paper itself. There's a, a hidden watermark on the newer bills that is only seen with a particular kind of light. There's a color shift that when you turn the bill, you can see on some of the magnetic bands. And there's a, um, a security strip that's red with only a particular kind of uh, black light. All these tests to tell if it's authentic. And some of you will know this, but those in uh, the, the Treasury Department or the uh, FBI that study counterfeit um, and, and the methods of counterfeit, th the way that they determine what's counterfeit is by being experts in what's authentic. They are... Uh, really good at knowing what the real thing looks like. Because it'd be impossible to look at all the fakes. You, the, the, the level of new counterfeits, is, is they're coming up with fakes so quickly that to study all the fakes would be exhausting. So what they're experts at is what does the genuine thing look like? How do we, and that's what helps them pick it out from all the rest. Let's think about that as we apply it to our faith. We're talking about what it means to live by faith in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. What does genuine, authentic, real faith look like? How do you know, how do I know, if my faith is real, if it's authentic? How can you tell? What are the tests of authentic faith? James chapter 1 tells us that our faith is tested whenever we face trials of various kinds. And that the testing of our faith produces something, refines the character and quality of our faith. Personally, I can look back on many moments in my life, perhaps you can as well, where my faith my trust in God has been tested, has been put to the test. And I've learned something about who God is and about myself every time. Sometimes we refer to these trials as defining moments. And you don't always know a defining moment when you're in it. Most often we know them by looking backwards. In the rearview mirror we see oh, that was significant. That was a defining moment in my life, in my life of living by faith. And just as there are defining moments in our personal journeys of faith, there are also defining moments in the story of our faith from the scriptures, like the history of what it means to live by faith that we're a part of, biblical history, what are the defining moments? Well, that's what we're going to examine today from Hebrews chapter 11, one of the key defining moments in the story of our faith. It's a story that, quite frankly, is challenging. It's troubling, even disturbing. But it's also powerful and I believe quite beautiful, if we understand it appropriately. It's the continuation of the story we saw last week when Pastor Joe talked to us about the, the beginning of the story of Abraham, God's call of Abraham to leave the land of his parents, of, of his upbringing, the land of Ur, of the Chaldeans, and to follow where God was going to take him. His trust in God when he said that, I'll give you a son of the promise to Abraham and his wife Sarah when they were old and beyond childbearing age. Abraham trusted God enough to follow him, and he believed God enough, even though they struggled with it, to that God would come through and give them a son. And in fact, God does give them a son named Isaac. We're looking at the continuation of that story in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, there's that word again, tested. His faith is tested. So at the outset, we see God is testing Abraham. He's doing something in his faith. He offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. 
Just a couple sentences there, three verses, but this is a profound and, and deep story. Scholars and theologians for centuries have debated the meaning and understanding of this story, and I don't think we're going to solve it all today. But we can know the heart of it. Robert Alter writes this in his commentary on the book of Genesis. He says, from a literary perspective, this is one of the high points of ancient Hebrew narrative and one of the best told stories in all of ancient literature. From an ethical and moral perspective, particularly to our modern sensibilities, this is a brutal and troubling story, frightening, can even one leave, leave one confused, even appalled. So just because there are some questions and difficult things in the story does not mean that God doesn't have something for us here and that we can't learn from it and that we can't understand the heart of a story and more importantly, the heart of God in the story. So to grasp it, we're going to go back to, as we've done each week in this series, the, the Old Testament story or, or book from which this, this Hebrew reference uh, is, is taken. What is Hebrews 11, 17 through 19 referring to? It's the story of Abraham offering up Isaac in Genesis 22. We're going to read 1 through 14 together. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together, and Isaac said to his father, Abraham, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place at which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there, laid the wood, in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar, on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is set up to this day on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Well, as I said, that's a powerful story and deeply troubling. So there's some lines in there that are even hard to read. What are we to make of them? We learned last week that Abraham's life is marked by the call of God. That from the beginning, what, what, what stands out about Abraham is that he responded to the call of God. The call in his life to follow and to trust me. And what we see here in this story, although it's, it's, it's hard for us to grasp at first, is the same call coming again. Trust me. God says to Abraham, leave the country of your family and your father and your upbringing and go to a land I will show you that you don't know yet. A lot of questions there. It doesn't make sense, but Abraham goes. Then God says, I'm going to give you a son by which I'll bless you and bless all nations through your, the son of the promise. And Abraham thinks, I'm way past childbearing age. How is this possible? God says, trust me. And then in this text, God asks Abraham to offer up his son. Why? God says, trust me, and I'll show you. So what stands out here is that Abraham responds to the call. What I want to talk to you about is the character of the call. What is the nature of this call we've been looking at the last several weeks? In every case, God is not exactly clear about what this is going to mean prior to Abraham's responding. And this is a key lesson in the life of faith. We want to have it all spelled out and laid out for us ahead of time, but that's not how God works. He says, trust me, believe when you don't see it, obey when you don't understand it. That's the character of the call. God says to Abraham, go. Abraham says, where? God says, 
I'll tell you later. God says to Abraham, you're going to have a son. Abraham says, how? God says, I'll show you later. God says to Abraham, offer up your son. Abraham says, why? And God says, I'll explain it later. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, we read this, this seminal line in the story of Abraham, and it reads, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God. And on that basis, he's counted as right before God. That's what the New Testament theologian Paul uh, and scholars since have called just, uh, justification by faith. Trusting in who God is and what he has said, even when we don't fully grasp it, is what makes us righteous in his sight. Not a perfect life, but faith in who God is. And, and, and we see in Genesis 22, verses 1 and 2, the text tells us, after these things, after, after these things, God tested Abraham. So after what things? Well, after everything that has happened in Abraham's life since Genesis 12. In other words, we're, we're ap approaching what you might think of as the pinnacle, the climax, the peak moment in the Abraham uh, saga or narrative. There are many seminal moments, many key uh, moments in the life of, of the history of our faith. But this story is, the, is the, sort of the pinnacle, the climax. After these things, God tested Abraham. So Abraham is called, God has called Abraham, he's followed. He's promised Abraham, he's believed. He's trusted in God and he's been counted righteous. And now comes this critical moment where God asks the unthinkable. By the way, this is not the same Abraham we meet back in Genesis 12. He's changed since he's been walking with God. He's not the same man that left Ur. When you walk with God by faith over time, it changes you. It does something in you. You learn about his character over time. We, you, it's not something you get by a Bible study for a couple of weeks or you get by, uh, there's no magic bullet to like a quick fix where you can understand all about God. The true knowledge of God comes by walking with him by faith over the years and trusting in him. And that's what Abraham's been doing. And he's ready for this quote unquote test. So when God says, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, doesn't that feel like, like God is like, he's piercing Abraham in, in our heart, like he's driving in the, the, the nail, so to speak, like your son, your only son, whom you love, the son of the promise. But here's the thing. God's not trying to be cruel. He's trying to point out that the son in Abraham, for Abraham is where he's placed all of his hope. Now, prior to this, Abraham trusted God for his son. Now he has his son. And where is his trust going to be? In what God has given him or in the God who's given it? That's a critical question. In other words, the only hope for this family resides in Isaac. So Ishmael, is, you might remember that story, he's not the son of the promise. He never was, and he's long gone anyway. Now there's Isaac, the son of the promise, the one God said he would give to them despite their old age, and he did. All the hope of the family, financially, and socially, relationally, uh, culturally, resides in Isaac. And God is asking Abraham to offer him up. This is shocking to us. It's troubling to us. And we're going to try to unpack what it really means. But before we get into it, I want you to see that one of the things this story teaches us is that in the life of faith, the call of God, it keeps coming to us. It's not a once upon a time thing. The call of God in the life of faith is not a once and done thing. It's not I trusted God way back when and now I'm kind of on my own doing my own thing. It's daily coming to us to trust him, to walk with him by faith. The call is what makes you a Christian. When you discover that God loves you, that he made you, that he sent his son to die for you, and you surrender your heart to him, you repent and trust in Jesus, that is the call. But it doesn't stop coming to us. The call not only makes you a Christian, the call continually comes, and you, that's how you grow as a Christian. Too many of us think that, yes, I believed in, in Jesus once upon a time, but now I'm pretty much on my own to sort this thing out called life. That is not how it works, according to Scripture. So the call of the gospel to repent and trust in, in Jesus is salvation. The call of the gospel to trust God every day of your life from that moment on is what we call sanctification, how we grow. That's what's happening here in Abraham's life. 
Martin Lloyd-Jones writes this, The call of the gospel is to recognize that without God, there are no foundations on which to build your life that will last. For Abraham, leave, go, trust, let go of everything else. I'll be your shield and reward. Because it's all going to be taken from you in the end anyway. You ever stop to think about that? Everything else you would build your life on, your, your material success, your family's achievements, your name, your reputation, it's all going to be taken from you. In the end, you cannot hold on to it. Your wealth can't take with you. Your career won't last. Your health absolutely won't last. Your reputation, your family. So what can we do then? The story of Abraham and Isaac is offer it up. Offer it up, because you can't hold on to it anyway. So that you can have the one thing you cannot lose. This is the heart of what God is trying to teach Abraham. So maybe I'll just pause here and say, we need to talk about what is our definition of our functional God in our life. You want a working definition for the true God of your heart? It's whatever is the non-negotiable for you. Whatever it is you think you cannot live without. Timothy Keller writes about this brilliantly. He says, whatever the thing is you think, I have to have this to be secure, to feel good about myself. Whatever that thing is, that's really your God, despite what you say. And I've been wrestling with that in my own heart. What, what's my functional God? Is it the success of the church? Is it my reputation? Or is it the God of the universe who made me and, died and gave himself for me and loves me? Well, what God is trying to do here in Abraham's life is teach him this lesson. The essence of the call is to make God the one non-negotiable in your life. The essence or character of the call is to bring us to the place where God himself is the one non-negotiable in my life because he alone is the one thing that cannot be taken from me or you. And here's the challenge, though. What do you hope God never asks of you? What is it deep in your heart that you hope, uh, uh, anything but this, Lord? What's the thing you think, I hope God never asked me to go there, to do this, to give up this? That's what's happening for Abraham. His whole life was trusting God. Now God has given him the one thing he most desired, a son, an heir. Don't take that from me, God. The son of the promise, Isaac, has become the functional God, perhaps, for Abraham, and God is dealing with that. And here's the real challenge. Sometimes the God who is trying to save you feels like he's trying to kill you. Sometimes the God who loves us and is trying to save us feels like he's trying to destroy us. Elizabeth Elliot wrote a book uh, called These Strange Ashes, tells a series of stories, and she tells one story in this book about watching a shepherd trying to disinfect uh, his sheep who had gotten these uh, parasites. And the way that the, they did this was to take the, each individual sheep and plunge them into this giant like barrel or vat of antiseptic and hold them underneath the surface, just their nose above so they could breathe. And then she has this little musing aside. She says, I wonder what it's like to be that little lamb or sheep, to feel like your shepherd is trying to drown you. These lambs are kicking and, and, and bleating and trying to get out, and the shepherd is holding them under. Why? For their good, to purify them, to save them, to cleanse them. They don't know that. They just feel like, the shepherd who I trust for my provision is holding me under and trying to kill me. I think Abraham knew what that felt like. Maybe you do. This brings us to the terror of the test. This is really the, the crux of the story. What is this test? Now, it's important to be clear that there are some things about this test for Abraham that are not universal for all followers of God and those who trust in Jesus. This is unique in salvific history. Many people, Christians and non-Christians alike, have wrestled deeply with the meaning of this story. And by the way, this story is also in the Quran. Did you know that? But in the Quran, uh, the story is really mostly about, it's entirely about the strength of Father Abraham's faith. It's an ethical teaching on our need for obedience to God unquestioningly in all situations. But this story has to be about more than just unquestioning obedience. Soren Kierkegaard wrote a book called Fear and Trembling, Danish philosopher, and he, he writes, if we say only that this story is just about the amazing faith of Abraham, then we really haven't understood because we haven't faced the terror of the test. 
Kierkegaard goes on to argue that God's requirements and his standards transcend human ethics. And th thus, thus Abraham obeyed God, not out of an ethical moral duty, but out of a deep relationship with God. That's crucial. Abraham's obedience is not, uh, you know, grudgingly uh, bowing the knee or ethical duty. It's out of a deep trust and relationship with God, even when it feels terrible. We really can't understand this unless we, we understand what this, this must have meant for Abraham in his day, in his historical context. So let me do a little cultural background for you. God does not tell Abraham to murder his son. He tells him to offer his son. And though we might not immediately grasp it, there is a difference. Why does he say this? This has to do with the significance of the firstborn in ancient Near Eastern cultures, what we would call the law of primogeniture. In ancient cultures, um, the, the law of the firstborn was that the firstborn son received the lion's share, the, by far the bulk of the inheritance, the land, the wealth, the property, the rights of the family. Not because the firstborn was necessarily better or more deserving, because it had to do with the preservation of the clan, of the family in that culture. I'll explain in a minute. So for Abraham, the command of God was terrible, but it was not as crazy as it sounds to us today. This is difficult for us in our individualistic society and our culture. Like perhaps you, you ask children or you've been asked this question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And we say, you can be whatever you want to be. The possibilities are endless. That whole way of thinking would have been totally foreign to somebody in the ancient world. They didn't, the, the question, what do you want to be when you grow up, wouldn't even make sense to them. What do you mean, what do I want to be? I am who I am. I'm part of this family. I have my role, my identity, my responsibilities as part of this clan, this tribe, this family. That's who I am, and there's no changing that. That's how they thought. They understood the firstborn son got everything, or the lion's share, not, not out of a sense of unfairness, but as a particular role to protect the growth and wealth and continuation of the clan, of the family. The family can't afford to divide up all the inheritance equally among the descendants. Then you're breaking up into smaller parts and you're putting the whole preservation of the family at risk in the ancient world. So the firstborn was to be the benefactor of everyone else in the future generations. That's why Isaac is so much as centered in this son. And that's why God says, offer him. Because your hope is not in him. It's in me. Now, by the way, just as a side note, the God, God of the Bible continually cuts against this law of primogeniture throughout history. We, we get Abel, not Cain. We get Jacob, not Esau. We'll talk about that next week. We get Isaac, not Ishmael. We get David, not his, his older brothers. Nevertheless, in all ancient cultures, they did look to the firstborn as the hope of the family. And so God establishes a symbolic pattern in the Old Testament scriptures that the life of the firstborn belongs to God. A couple of scriptures here to, to highlight this point. In, Je in Exodus 22, verse 29, we read this. You shall not delay to offer from the fullness of your harvest and from the outflow of your presses the firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. And then the, New Test or the Old Testament prophet Micah, chapter 6, we'll all know Micah 6, verse 8. What does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God? Well, here's what he says in verse 7, the verse before that. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of, of my body for the sin of my soul? Why would Micah write that? He's referring to the law of, of the firstborn. That, that there is a debt of sin owed by every individual and by every family and that God has the right to call in that debt. We owe it to him. So if God had asked Abraham to offer up his wife or to kill his wife, Abraham would have refused and God would never have asked that. When God asks him to offer up Isaac, though it sounds crazy to us, Abraham, though filled with terror, understood that the God whom he was trusting was calling in the debt of sin. And he had every right to do so. So it was terrible, but not crazy to Abraham. This is the real terror of the test. The command of God appears to contradict the promise of God. I want you to hear that. The command of God, offer up your son, 
appears to contradict the promise of God. I'm going to give you a son through which I'll bless all nations. How, how can these be? How can these go together? I don't get it. Maybe you felt that way in your life. How can you ask this God and then promise this God? I don't get how those go together. How can you say that you give good things and you want to bless your children and my wife, my husband, my son, my daughter is suffering from cancer or facing this terrible situation? I don't get how those go together. There's a place in the book of Daniel where when, when uh, challenged by, uh, to renounce their faith, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace say to the king, our God is able to save us. But even if he doesn't, I'll praise him. The book, our rooting classes refer to this as double-fisted faith. He is able, but even if he doesn't, I'm going to praise him. We hold these things in tension, in other words. I think part of the life of faith is holding in tension because we don't always reconcile it, how God can command one thing and promise another thing and how it all works out in our lives. Let me ask it this way. How can the God of a just command also be the God of a gracious promise. It is, if God is not just, then what hope is there for the world? If God isn't a God of justice, and he, if he won't one day right every wrong, then what hope is there for a world that's so much brokenness and injustice? On the other hand, if God is not gracious, what hope is there for you and for me? If he, if he doesn't pardon those who seek him and expect and, and give us grace and mercy. This brings us to the power of the provision, the last point. We see the character of the call, trust me, even if you don't get it. The terror of the test, offer up to me that which you feel is non-negotiable in your life. And this brings us to the climax, the power of the provision. The entire story is emotionally charged, but I think the center of this story is verses six through eight. It's the only recorded conversation between uh, Abraham and Isaac, father and son. And by the way, for those of you that may not be familiar, Isaac is not a little boy. He's not a toddler. I think we think of him that way. He would have been somewhere between his late teens and early 20s at this stage of his life. So he's going to have to trust his father with this and get onto that altar while his father's trusting his heavenly father. But look at how Abraham responds to his son's question. This is crucial. Let's look at verses 7 through 8 of Genesis 22. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. By the way, every time Abraham's addressed by God and by his son, he says, here I am. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. And to his son even, here I am, my son. He said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Now, this means Isaac has been with his father to offer sacrifices before. He understands wood, fire, stone, altar. We're going to make an offering to the Lord. I get this. But something is missing this time. Where is the lamb? Where is the one to be sacrificed? Look at what Abraham says. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb. God will provide for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. Earlier in the story, when Abraham has his servants with him before they get to this point, he says to his servants, stay here at the base of the mountain. My son and I, we will go up and we will return to you. How can he say that? Is he just trying to put their fears at ease? Is he trying not to let anybody know what he's doing? I think he's even there trusting by faith in what he cannot see. Abraham says, God himself will provide. He believed that God would provide. That's what kept him going up the mountain. What, I, would have, I don't think I could have done it. Keep going up that mountain? It was not, by the way, Abraham's sheer faith and self-determination that got him up the mountain. It was his relationship with God. Look at verse 19 of Hebrews chapter 11 once more. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. It's giving us insight into what's going on in Abraham's mind. He's thinking, I don't know how God's going to do this. Isaac, you don't see a lamb. I don't see a lamb, but God will see to it. I don't know how he's going to do it. Perhaps he'll provide a substitute. Perhaps he'll bring you back from the dead. I don't know. But I know the God who does see what we don't see. As a matter of fact, 
The Hebrew word used in Genesis 22 uh, in verse 8 uh, for provide is the same root word as to see. Here's why that's interesting. Abraham's saying essentially, Isaac, you don't see. I don't see. But God does. And he will see to it. It's the name, by the way, that Abraham gives the mountain. He calls the place that the, the Lord will provide. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. We call this Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh Yareh, meaning God provides, the Lord will provide. And literally it means, it could be translated, the Lord will provide or the Lord will see. The Lord sees to it. Because even in Latin, the, the English word provide, the Latin root is pro vide. Pro, before, vide, vision. Vision before, foresight, in other words. To provide is to see to a need ahead of time and provide for it. That's what God is doing for Abraham. He sees what Abraham doesn't. He sees what Isaac doesn't. He sees what you don't. He sees what I don't. He sees to it even when we don't. And we walk by faith, trusting him, the Apostle Paul says, not by sight. Even when what it feels like we're being asked to do is unthinkable, is impossible, is terrible. We trust the God who sees the God who provides. So, in other words, with God, to see is to foresee. We see and know, by the way, what Abraham could only guess at. We see clearly in hindsight what he looked at through a glass darkly. Because in 2 Chronicles 3, verse 1, we're told that the, on the mountains of Moriah is where they're to offer sacrifices. These are the same mountains, by the way, the same region where Jerusalem is today and where Calvary was when Jesus was crucified. Here's the point. On Mount Moriah, the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. God is trying to teach Abraham what he himself is prepared to do on the cross. I think this is the whole point of the story. God is showing Abraham what you think is your non-negotiable and your greatest hope needs to be offered to me, and then you will see what I am prepared to do for you. The lengths to which I will go to redeem you, to sustain you, and to bless you. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 8. We studied this just a couple of weeks ago in our previous series called The Greatest Chapter. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? By the way, I'm certain that Abraham, and maybe you have felt at times like God is not for me, he's against me because of what he's asking you to do or walking by faith feels hard. But here's how Paul goes on. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? How do you know God loves you? How do you know God's for you? How can you know that God is really and truly for you? What did he give? What did he sacrifice? But here's the hard truth. You will not see the provision of the Lord, not fully, not really, unless you're willing to go up the mountain. If we aren't willing to do what he asks us to do, even when we don't grasp it, we will not see and experience his grace and mercy and provision the way he longs to give it to us because we're holding on too tight to whatever it is is our non-negotiable. We, we want to, I want to experience God's provision and grace and mercy on my terms. I wish it could be so. Actually, I don't wish that. I'm learning again and again. That's not the best way. And it's certainly not the way the life of faith works. You don't get to call the shots or set the terms. You can only surrender and trust and follow. And then you will see how God provides. So I really think what this story wants us to do is to take the words of Genesis 22, verse 12, and flip them around and speak it back into us. Because God says to uh, Abraham in this story, in Genesis 22, verse 12, he says, that now I know that you, that you, that you fear me because you did not withhold your only son from me. But what if we flip those things around? Here's what God says. And now I know that you, did not, that you, did not, that you fear me because you did not withhold your only son from me. What if we turn these around and said it this way? And we said to God, now I know. Now I know that you love me, Lord because you did not withhold your only son from me. Now I know that you are for me, that you love me, 
that you forgive me, that you'll never leave me because the lengths that you have, were willing to go and that you did go for me. God stops Abraham and provides a substitute. He does the same for us. He provides a substitute himself. He is the lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, offered in our place. That's how we know. And I think this ancient story, which is troubling to us, which is hard for us to grasp, which, frankly, many of us want to dismiss and, 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 and reject out of hand, has something very powerful to say to us if we're willing to listen. The character of the call is, offer up to God that which you think is non-negotiable in your life. Surrender it to him. Sacrifice it to him. There's a terror in that test. We don't want to. But when we're willing to do that, we see the power of his provision for us in Christ. How will he, who did not withhold his own son, graciously give us all things? Let's pray. God, we thank you for this story. We confess it makes us tremble. Uh, it's hard for us to grasp. But the truth is, you are a God that ought to make us tremble and sometimes are hard for us to grasp. But when we trust you and walk by faith in obedience to you, we begin to see how good how merciful, how loving you truly are because we know what you've given for us. And that is your son, your only son, whom you love. His name is Jesus and in his name we pray, amen. What a great line we repeated in that song, not for a moment will you forsake me. We may feel it at times, we may wonder if he has forsaken us, but return again to the truth of what God's word says, not for a moment has he or will he ever forsake you. Brothers and sisters, go in that knowledge, the knowledge that God is for you, that he loves you, that he'll never forsake you because he has given his son for you. Amen, and go in peace.